So welcome to this week of uh, IDSB 10, and we're going to continue discussing intellectual property, and uh, the topic of this week is copying, piracy, and cultural production in the new commons. I hope you've already had a look at the readings for this week. And intellectual property, we discussed quite a bit um, during last week's uh, class, we discussed um, especially cases of patenting and so on. If we look a little bit uh, back at the history of copyright, um, there are different uh, stories about where the idea of copyright came from and was first expressed, but uh, commonly we think of the Statute of Anne as the first example of a copyright legislation, and this uh, the statute was expressly for the furthering of the creative arts. So this is the incentive theory, which says that if people are able to benefit financially from their creations, they are likely to produce more. And so we will all benefit from this copyright legislation because we will all get access to a, a larger library of books, of plays, of music, uh, and so on. And in fact, even today, in, in today's uh, copyright discussions, this is a point that's often brought up by um, people who are criticizing pirates or uh, even attempts at, at uh, using open licenses as eroding this incentive <coughs> and portraying the idea that there will be no more music created, no more movies, no books written, unless we can provide a secure and substantial compensation system for authors. There are <clears throat> different kinds of intellectual property, of course, and look that, and notice that I put intellectual property in um, citation uh, quotes because many people uh, in the copyright debates believe that the term intellectual property in itself uh, biases the debate towards those who believe that, for example, piracy is equal to stealing. Um, whereas others would say, well, if you steal something, it means that the original owner doesn't have that thing anymore. Whereas with intellectual property, of course, if I illegally download a movie, <coughs> that does not mean that the original, that the studio does no, no longer has that movie. It just means that I also have that movie without paying. And so, uh, so intellectual property as a term is contested, but it's, it's a useful kind of a catch-all for these different kinds of uh, protections. And these protections include copyright, which, is, which only protects a specific expression of an idea. So it doesn't protect an idea. It protects an, a specific expression of an idea. An example of that uh, is that I cannot, if you wrote an article and you copyrighted it, or a journal copyrighted it, then I cannot take that article and copy it without your permission. I cannot make it available on a website, etc. But if I read that article and I wrote a blog post where I repeated all of your points um, in, in great detail using my own words, that would not be infringing your copyright. In an academic setting, this would be called plagiarism. However, plagiarism is not a legal concept. It's a academic concept. So, of course, anything that you produce in a, in a university uh, setting, you have to worry about plagiarism, but, that, but that's not something that, um, that is covered by law. Um, and, in fact, the way of getting around plagiarism isn't to not include content. It's to cite very carefully where that content came from. So copyright only protects specific expressions of ideas, and they also have to be recorded in some medium. Uh, so theoretically, somebody's spoken uh, lecture, for example, is not protected by copyright until it's recorded or written down or somehow recorded. Patents, on the other hand, uh, do protect specific ideas. And patents also initially were aimed at promoting the publishing of ideas, which might seem a little bit uh, contradictory, but think about the, the fact that historically uh, 
because there were no patents, people who wanted a competitive edge had to keep things as trade secrets. And there are extreme cases of this where, for example, um, the only way to learn how to become a watchmaker uh, in, in all Switzerland would be to apprentice with a uh, with with a with an existing watchmaker, and they were very scared of of people stealing their secrets, um, and might even uh, go so far as to cut off your hand um, if you attempted to t teach these secrets to others outside the guild that controlled this this secret knowledge. Um, similarly, in, in you know China, old China protected the secret of how they made porcelain. For a long time, and anyone caught uh, stealing these secrets would be uh, tried as a spy. So the idea of patent patents was uh, giving people the option of having a monopoly on a certain idea or a certain way of manufacturing and so on. But to get this monopoly, you would have to document in detail uh, the exact workings of your idea, and this document was made public right away, not after 15 years, but right away. And of course, after a much shorter period, typically than the copyright period, other people would be able to use your ideas. And this is, for example, why we have what's called generic medicines. So aspirin, when it first came out, was, was patented, and nobody else would be allowed to um, make copies of aspirin. But after uh, the patent period is expired, which is um, typically 15 years, any company in the world is allowed to make copies. And of course, the production process, or at least the contents, uh, chemical composition is already well documented. And that's why we can suddenly buy medicines, uh, generic medicines that are uh, very, very cheap. Now, another protection is, is uh, a trademark protection, which pr protects a company's name and logo. And this is the main purpose of this is to protect uh, someone's brand and to avoid consumer confusion. So that if you buy something, if, for example, a certain company has spent a lot of time uh, building up a reputation of uh, good customer service, of high quality products, then when you're buying a product with that name, you trust that it will be of high quality. And if somebody misused that brand um, on something that's maybe cheap and knockoff, then that erodes the, the value of the original brand. So either way, that's um, just a little introduction to these different kinds of intellectual properties. And some of this might be a bit of repetition from for you from things um, from earlier in the course, but I think it's it's useful to differentiate because I often see people are not very clear about this and conflate, for example, patents with copyright. In this lecture, we'll talk mostly about copyright, though, and copywriting cultural works, which is a very different dis discussion from, for example, patenting um, medicines and so on. Now, the, the incentive theory, which I mentioned previously, was exactly that uh, that the purpose of, of copyright was to encourage more invention, to encourage more creation. Now, there is, of course, people who question uh, to what extent this is correct. You know, noting that people have been creating uh, throughout, the, throughout the ages, long before there was any kind of copyright, uh, copyright uh, agreements. And so we have to be kind of critical as well when we see this theory being um, mentioned. But basically, the foundational pillars of uh, most copyright legislation is originality, that this is something brand new that has never been said or played or drawn before. The idea of authorship, that, it can, that the creation can be ascribed to one individual or a s specific group of people, and this idea of incentive. And of course, people have also questioned these other pillars and said, well, is anything really original anymore? Um, you know, is is there really one author when what you do is a small variation on things that have, you know, this inc incredible culture that has grown for thousands and thousands of years, and we all build on 
on the shoulders of, of, of the greats in the past. I mean, I've, I've seen people who said that every single uh, Hollywood movie is the variation of a few Greek epic poems. Um, of course, they are different, but they are building on something that existed. And if that's the case, is it really fair to use these concepts of complete originality and unique authors? Now, initially, copyright was uh, quite limited in time span. Um, however, it has continued to be extended um, so that the current um, copyright period in the U.S. is 70 years after the death of the author. That's a, a very interesting, interesting formulation, too. It's not after the, the publication of the work, but it's after the death of the author. And, of course, this means that it's not only the author, he or, he, he or she, she self, that benefits from this, from the income from their pr production, but it's the the ancestors of their ancestors um, that not only benefit but also control access to to these works. Um, and because this has been pushed further and further back, it means that works that you know should have been in public domain um, today are still covered by copyright. Now, public domain means that anyone can do anything with a work. There is uh, no copyright uh, protection and people can build on it freely. Typically works go into copyright when uh, this time limit expires, but there are also certain conditions in which a work can enter into copyright directly. And one example of this is in that in the US every work produced by, by the federal government is immediately made public in, in the public domain. Uh, this is different from Canada, where we have cr crown copyright and products of the, uh, of the government, such as, for example, statistics from Statistics Canada, are not available publicly and might have to be purchased. So, moving on. Lawrence Lessig... Uh, who is uh, who is a lawyer wrote a very really interesting book called Code 2.0, and and he the book kind of introduces a very interesting distinction which is becoming more and more relevant as more and more uh, cultural products are uh, moving to the to uh, the internet and into software. So if you think about Second Life, which is this um, immersive 3D environment. Um, it's kind of like World of Warcraft, uh, different kinds of games where you're moving around, uh, you have a personality and you're moving around in this, in this new world. Now, in that world, uh, you could create laws and you could say you are not allowed to do certain things. Just as in our uh, traditional society, we have laws stating what we are allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. However, in Second Life and in similar software uh, simulated worlds, the, the owners have another option. They can simply make certain actions unavailable. So if they tell you, you are not allowed to steal somebody's money, they could replace this law with a few lines of software code, which makes it physically impossible for you to steal somebody else's money. And of course, if that is physically impossible, there is no need for this law to exist. Now, this might seem like kind of a, a far-fetched example because most of us don't spend very much time in immersive 3D worlds. And even though science fiction writers want us to believe that in the future this is where we're going to spend our lives, um, currently that's not a, a really big concern for us. However, I'm using this as an example of how um, copyright uh, control can move from the legal code to software code and you know while we might not spend a lot of time in in Second Life a lot of us like to watch DVDs now there are actually um, a lot of ex uh, exceptions for different kinds of uses in the in the in the copyright code and these of course vary from country to country um, but typically, if you were teaching a class on the history of film, you would be allowed to take very small snippets 
or screenshots of different films and show them in your class. Um, this is uh, used for educational purpose, you're taking a very small part, and you're clearly not trying to benefit from stealing this movie. And of course, people who see your little clips um, will not say, oh, I've seen this little clip, so now I don't need to buy the movie. In fact, they're probably more likely to buy the movie. So the filmmaker is not really losing out here. However, if you were trying to do that with DVDs, you would find out that in many cases you are not able to do so. There are There is something called Digital Rights Management, or DRM, which is a collection of technologies that are trying to stop you from copying. Uh, so rather than relying on the laws and the courts and and so on, they actually make it uh, impossible for you to copy. And in uh, the US they have a law called the DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which uh, a copy of which they are uh, currently looking at implementing in, in, the, in Canada. And this law makes it illegal for you to break any copy protection. Regardless of whether the purpose for which you are breaking the copyright protection is actually legal. Uh, for example, uh, in many countries it is legal for you to keep a backup copy of a cultural product that you've bought. You know, so if you buy a DVD, you're allowed to make a private one-time copy in case your original DVD gets scratched or lost. But it doesn't help you very much to have this right if you are not able to make this copy. And libraries, for example, have been very concerned about this because libraries are tasked with, with keeping cultural products for as long as possible. Uh, they are also... Uh, so a good example of, of this is um, Linux is, a, is an open source uh, um, operating system. And there is no legal, or there used to be no legal DVD player on Linux because to make a DVD player, you would need to get a license from the DVD consortium and pay them a certain amount of money to get the, the key that is used to be able to read DVDs. So a Norwegian programmer, uh, I think he was 17 or 15 at the time, very young guy, he went to his local video rental store and rented a DVD and said, I would like to watch this on my laptop. Turns out his laptop is a Linux laptop. So he said, why is it that this DVD that I paid money for, you know, I should have a right to watch this DVD on any device that I choose. So of course he sat down and he was able to crack through the protection of DVDs and to watch this DVD. And he published what he... Um, found out so that other people could also do the same thing. Now, um, cracking that protection also means that you enable um, piracy, i.e. you enable people to copy DVDs and give or sell to other people, but that was not his purpose. And so when he was later sued in court for uh, breaking this copy protection, because he was in Norway, uh, the court threw the case out and said, well, he wanted to see this DVD, which he paid honest money for, and he should have the option of seeing that DVD in any device that he chooses. But if that court case had been run in the US, he would probably have lost. So in this case, you have um, the example of, of companies controlling exactly under which conditions that you use their products, and doing so outside of the purview of the copyright law. Uh, another example of this is click wrap licenses. And, uh, this is typically when you download a new piece of software, you get this very, very long legal document and you have to say, I accept. Of course, most of us will not take the time to read this. Um, in fact, even if we did read it, it might be so difficult legal language that it would be very difficult for us to actually understand the implications. But of course, we want to use the game or the, the software that we downloaded and so we click I accept. Now, in that license, there are there might be many conditions that um, hinder us from doing things that we or ordinarily would have access to doing um, as allowed by the Copyright Act. And this is becoming very relevant. I mean, I mentioned already with, with um, digital video, for example, but now that uh, digital books, ebooks, are becoming more and more uh, common, 
uh, suddenly you go from a, a situation where you buy something and you have complete control over it to a situation where you effectively rent something. So uh, traditionally you have this uh, idea of a first sale doctrine which means that I uh, go to a bookstore and I buy a book and I pay for it. After I've paid for that book I can do anything I want with that book. So I can easily um, I can sell it to someone else for any price that I choose. I can rent it to people and charge money for the time that they rent it. Uh, I can uh, cut it out and you know, create a sculpture out of it. I can do basically what I want with it. But uh, with digital content, uh, you do not have this option. So let's say I buy a book on the, on, on the Kindle from Amazon that book can only be read on my specific Kindle. Um, if I finish reading it and I want to sell the book to you, there is no way of doing this other than cracking into the technical system. There's no legal way of doing that. Uh, and in fact, there was an example where people had bought a certain book from Amazon, which Amazon later found out that they didn't really have the right to sell, and so without their user's permission, they went into their user's devices and deleted that book. All right. So imagine in the real world equivalent of a bookstore breaking into your house at night and removing a book that you've bought from your nightstand and leaving a check for $20 uh, there. And this is something that becomes very scary um, in the future when people suddenly can reach into our devices and, and control um, what we have access to. So, uh, something to, to certainly um, think very critically about as, as uh, more and more of our cultural uh, creations become available online and in this, this um, DRM'd format. The idea of a copyleft license um, is kind of a, an answer to this, this uh, copyright machine that keeps expanding the length of copyright and limiting uh, the use that people can have from this. It comes from open source. Uh, it comes from, um, so, sorry, from uh, from the world of technology. And, and it was one person co uh, called Richard Stallman who wanted, you know, access to the source code of, of a program so that he could write a printer driver for his, um, for his computer because you know, back in the time, there were lots of different kinds of uh, computers and printers, and people using computers were often almost expected to to write a little bit of programming to make sure that things worked well with each other. And he was he was very upset when the company uh, that I think created the printer uh, refused to to release the um, the source code for its um, for its drivers, and he said, you know, I, I want to. Um, create a license that instead of taking rights away from people actually grant extra rights to people uh, or ensure their access to rights. So he came up with a license which was called um, the GNU Public License and this is the website of the Free Software Foundation which he founded and the idea of this license is that you can download something for free, you can get access to the source code, so it's the underlying uh, way that something was programmed. You can modify the source code. You can release your new product to anyone. You can even sell it for money. But the only thing you have to make sure is that anyone else who gets that product also has um, access to your source code and has the same rights. So that's the reason why this has been called a viral license because it kind of infects all the other products that derives from it. And this has been a huge success um, in the in the software world. Um, many of the programs that you use today are probably built on open source, including Firefox, for example, or Chrome, different web browsers. And most of the servers running the internet are running some kind of open source programs. This inspired a, 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 a huge group of, of creative individuals who said, well, you know, I'm not a programmer, but I wonder how these ideals can apply to things that I do, such as um, academic research or creation of educational resources 
or creation of other cultural expressions. And the result of this um, became a license called Creative Commons. Of course, there, there have been other examples as well, but this is the most well-known. And it allows you to state when you publish something on the internet whether you would like people to be able to um, copy it freely, uh, to modify it. Um, you can choose whether they can, uh, they're allowed to make money from it or not. And you can do so in a very simple way so that there is no um, con confusion about what you, what you wish to happen. Because another thing that has, has happened from these copyright licenses were first introduced um, what is that initially these copyright licenses mainly pertain to companies. Um, for individuals, they would never really have to deal with this. The, the purpose was to avoid one publishing company ripping off another publishing company. And yet today we are all digital publishers. We all publish things every day on Facebook, we upload pictures on Flickr, and so each one of us owns thousands of objects that have that are covered by copyright. And in fact, they also changed the law so that initially you had to actually register an object uh, with the copyright um, register in order for that object to be covered by copyright. But today, anything that you reg that you record in any format, whether you write it down or you upload it to Facebook, is automatically covered by copyright. However, do you really need that picture that you took of the Eiffel Tower to be covered by copyright 70 years after you die? Would you really mind if someone else took that picture and used it in a class report? So if you wouldn't mind, then how do you let other people know about this preference? And this is exactly where Creative Commons uh, becomes useful. Um, a great example of the kind of collaboration online that Creative Commons licenses can enable is this website called CC Mixter, which encourages musicians to upload not finished songs, but um, individual tracks of music that they're playing with. Right. So let's say that you are that you love to love to sing, and you might record a song that you've 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 come up with. You could put it here. Someone in another country could download that song. And add a drum track and they might upload it somebody else might download those two tracks and add uh, the saxophone right and so you kind of collaboratively build this this cultural product that wouldn't be available it wouldn't be possible to do this a without kind of the internet but B without this license which says yes please take my thing and build upon it and Wikipedia is another great example of a, a collaborative cultural product that uses these um, open licenses. So uh, I talked about um, these copyleft licenses and another, um, another really important aspect of this of course is this idea of a cultural imposition because right now you know if you're living in in a developing country, you're probably accessing a huge amount of cultural products from the West. You're probably seeing American movies. Uh, you might have access to American educational materials. And under a traditional copyright, you are not able to change or modify any of this to fit better into your local situation. For example, um, in Russia, there were some authors who said, you know, it's so sad that um, all of our kids love to read about Harry Potter, but um, they would love for Harry Potter to visit Russia, and he will never visit Russia. So they wrote a new book called Harry Potter Visits Russia, and this was an entire Harry Potter novel, not a copy of an existing Harry Potter, but a brand new novel where Harry Potter goes to Russia and fights different kinds of, of um, ghosts and magicians and so on, which was very popular on the market. And of course, this is completely illegal because Harry Potter is um, is protected by copyright. But it's the kind of thing which many people argue should be should be possible. So I'm going to briefly sum up here, um, and looking at the economic impact for developing countries. This is a very complex um, question, but it's uh, um, and it's funny how now developing con developed countries typically 
claim that the only way that um, develop, developing countries can uh, benefit from the same kind of um, innovation and, and creativity is to have very strict copyright regimes. But the case is that his historically, um, for example, the U.S. had a very lax uh, copyright regime for as long as it needed to kind of establish itself. It was um, pu publishing huge amounts of, of uh, novels uh, copied from Britain, uh, encyclopedias and everything without giving any licensing fee back to the British um, until such a time as their own creative industries were strong enough that they uh, could begin uh, imposing these copyrights. Um, today, however, the copyright regime is actually surprisingly uniform across the world because, um, because of pressure, for example, from the World Trade Organization that um, pushes every country uh, to accept these international guidelines if they want to uh, be able to do trade with, um, with Western countries. Um, and luckily, there are alternative economic models um, because obviously artists and, and uh, inventors and academics and so on still have to make, um, make a living. And the idea that you have uh, these free cultural products um, does not mean that you don't want anyone to make money. Um, in fact, free in this case does not mean free of cost. It means free as in freedom. And so I, I'm not going to talk much about this, but I hope you have a look at at the readings for this week, where you will see some examples of um, creative productions that um, use open licenses or are in practice uh, thought of as open products, but still enable the authors to make money. And uh, another thing is the documentary Good Copy, Bad Copy, whose link I added to your... Um, to your wiki page for this week, which is a really great watch. I really recommend it. It's an openly licensed movie, free to download, and it shows. It talks about, for example, the techno brega um, phenomenon in Brazil. This huge music m movement, which makes all of its money through concerts and um, uses kind of the pirate uh, distribution chain to advertise basically the the different bands, and also Nollywood, which is um, actually the biggest uh, film producing uh, area in the world, which is in Nigeria, making more than 900 movies per year, um, where, again, they make movies so quickly um, and distribute them so cheaply that they are able to undercut any kind of pirate offering. So really fascinating stories, and um, I'd love for you to have a look at them, and maybe we'll have an interesting discussion about this in the forums. So have a great weekend, have a great uh, upcoming week, and uh, look forward to hearing from all of you.